70% of the water use and waste and pollution creating dead zones in the ocean is because of industrial farming. And what is parading today is science, is not science anymore. The tools and technologies you evolve, basically we have declared war against the earth. And in declaring the war against the earth, we have declared war against people. You know, growing up in Dehradun, in Dune Valley, with Rishikesh right next door, I was very blessed as a little child to meet some of the most important saints and sages of our times. Um, Swami Shivananda, Maheshi Mahesh Yogi, um, Ananda Mahima, Sant Kripal Singh Ji, Neem Karoli ba Baba, all of whom have had huge influence um, on people across the world. And of course, as you mentioned, Deepak, my heart and passion for studying nature at that time um, took me to the foundations of quantum theory. Um, I came to North America because my PhD guide in India was saying, just do the calculations, don't ask questions. And of course, I wasn't doing quantum theory just to do calculations, I wanted to figure out. And of course, the wonderful thing about it is, um, from the 1930s to now, those deep debates are still alive, and I know they'll still be alive 100 years from now. That's why I took a little time off. Even if I turn back to it at 80, we'll be discussing non-locality, we'll be dis discussing potentials, We'll be dis dis discussing irreducible probability. And those were the three big teachings I took out of my uh, higher studies in physics. That we weren't inhabiting a world of billiard balls, of separation, of hard immutable matter, of deterministic quantity with no quality. Quantum theory ta taught us non-separability, taught us non-locality. It taught us potential, and built into potential the more powerful plurality, the fact that things can unfold in different ways. In, in India, we call it Bahuda, the Bahuda Sanskriti, you know? And that's why I love the images of Indian goddesses, always with many, many, many hands, because nothing is just one thing. None of us are just one thing. So while in the quantum world, and we had some of the best minds sharing the quantum world with us, uh, the billiard ball image is gone in the real world of life and death, that billiard ball worldview is more dominant than ever. And that's the reason I've turned to areas like agriculture. Because not only is it 100 years out of date, it's a primitive science, but being so inappropriate to the complexity and self-organization and diversity of life, that crudeness of an obsolete worldview, a mechanistic reductionist framework of thinking that we received at the time of the rise of the empire, where it was considered that veneration of nature, wherewith men are imbued for what they call nature, has been discouraging impediment to the empire of man over the inferior creatures of God. That's Boyle, as New England governor. Or Bacon, who said you have to torture and rape nature to know her. Um, he even wrote a book called The Birth of Masculine Time, with the assumption that interconnectedness and understanding systems in the whole was effeminate. And I loved someone who said, I, I think it was Vincent de Fox, who said the future will be womanly. And Gandhi said a daily prayer, make me more womanly. Um, Caroline Merchant has talked about that uh, the rise of that mechanical philosophy 
in, as the death of nature. Because if nature is dead, you're doing no harm. If you see nature as a nurturing mother, you couldn't be creating the level of devastation on this planet that's taking place. You could not readily slay a mother, dig her entrails, mutilate her body. But the mastery and domination images that have been built into the Baconian paradigm that continue to be called science, even in today's world, are wreaking havoc on this planet. And I saw it in my days with the Chipko movement, this amazing movement of women who came out in my region and said, we're going to hug the trees. You can't cut them. And at that time, scientific forestry treated forests as timber mines. The women taught the country that forests were related to water. Forests were related to soil. Forests were related to the air. It took 10 years of protests, but eventually, our policies were changed. In fact, our entire environment movement was, contemporary environment movement was shaped by Chipko. And then 1984, India had a series of tragedies and disasters. Um, the tragedy of Bhopal, where the largest human tragedy were killed. 3,000 people in one night, 30,000 dead since then, where a pesticide plant of Union Carbide leaked. That same summer, there was, terrorism was at its height in Punjab, and the army was sent to enter the Golden Temple. The Sikhs felt very violated. Um, 30,000 people had been killed in Punjab because of extremism. But when the Sikh security of Indira Gandhi assassinated her, there was a backlash, and more Sikhs were killed, and it was a genocide. And by the end of 1984, I wanted to understand why had agriculture become like war and realized agriculture had become like war because it came from war. Every herbicide, every pesticide that we use was a war chemical. Even the nitrogen fertilizers came out of the explosive factories. Um, I did a study on the Green Revolution, Punjab, for the United Nations at that time and found that that billiard ball that we'd given up in quantum theory was still alive in the category called high yielding variety, as if that variety had fixed qualities and quantities. No, it was a high response variety. It responded well to chemicals, which is why it was created as a dwarf variety. Um, the soil in the textbooks of that time was defined as an empty container into which you put NPK nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, as if that was all that the soil needed. And we've been told without the Green Revolution, the world wouldn't have been fed. Norman Borlaug got a Nobel Peace Prize for this. When I went to Punjab, I realized the fields weren't producing more than our fields up in the Garhwal, in the Himalaya. And I called that blindness the monoculture of the mind. You stop to see because you're working on producing a single commodity, just the rice, just the wheat. You increase its production at the cost of biodiversity, but at the very, very high costs to the planet and to people. <laughs>